you know, I was really appreciative of Lester reminding us that we live in America's finest city. Because most of the week, all I've seen is images of Afga Afghanistan and hurricane approaching New Orleans, the COVID cases going up and deaths and experiencing it in my own family and just it, it's overwhelming at times you just feel like you're s just swamped by negative stuff and it's good for us to remember you know <laughs> i've been complaining about inflation it cost me twice as much to drive over here a week now than it used to and Yet I can drive over here. Amen. And I can actually afford the yeah. four something a gallon. And so trying to keep focused on the positive things and not be dragged down by the negative things. Let's let's go to the Father in prayer. Amen. Father, we do thank you for our lives and how blessed we are, Father. We know that that we have it really good. Father, we know that life is filled with turmoil and chaos and, and ups and downs constantly. Father, we pray that, that we will anchor ourselves in you and that you will be the rock of our salvation and that we will not be swayed by the surges of difficulties that hit us. Father, help us to remember that that we can do all things through you who gives us strength and to keep our eyes on you. And, and Father, we, we want to pray a special prayer for those in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And Father, just for that whole situation over there, you know what's best, Lord. And pray for our leaders who make decisions that affect so many people, Father, that, that you would... Um, that you would give them wisdom and help them to do the right things. And Father, I, I pray for those in the line of uh, this hurricane that's approaching Louisiana and ask that you keep them safe, Father, and I pray that they have made the preparations needed to be safe. And Father, I just ask that you would help us to help us to do whatever we can to serve and to help and to be sympathetic and compassionate toward others who go through difficult times in their lives. Father, help us to clothe ourselves with the compassion of Jesus and help us, Father, to really love our neighbors as ourselves and to want the best for all people, Father. Please be with us now this morning as we encourage one another and we're reminded of of the lord's uh, plan for us and that we would be committed to it fully committed pray this in jesus name amen, amen. amen. all right so we uh, are continuing our series on fully committed and i i know you know when you look at the church, when you look at the book of Acts, the, the first book I ever studied after becoming a Christian was the book of Acts. And it, it shows you the beginning of the church. And this was the church that Jesus had planned and, and foretold that was, was going to be established and that you know, there would be leaders that would be rocks, you know, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail <laughs> against it. And, and we see that church born in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Peter, the apostle, gets up, preaches the gospel to this, this great, huge crowd that had come to Jerusalem for the Passover and and he, he preached the gospel of Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And 3,000 people that day were baptized. 3,000 people were moved by the message of the gospel and were baptized. 
And the very first thing that we read about the church in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 is that those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. The very first thing that they did after making their commitment to Jesus and being baptized was to devote themselves. And I want us to just think about the meaning of this word for a second. The word devoted in the Bible is different than the word committed, okay? And it's important to understand the difference of the two. Making a commitment is, is just something you decide to do. Um, when we make a commitment in marriage, we, we say we're going to be faithful and, and so forth. When we make a commitment to Jesus, we say we're going to change. We're going to give our lives to him and serve him for the rest of our lives. And it's really about your word, your word. I'm committing to this. And devotion is about the doing of it. It's about the following through with that commitment. Yeah, you commit it, but as you know, people don't always keep their commitments, right? And so this idea of being devoted comes from the Greek word proskartereo. Proskartereo. Like that? <laughs> Eddie's smiling. One more time, Jim. Proskartereo. <laughs> But it literally means to be earnest towards, to be constantly diligent in, to adhere to closely. And, and it really describes not just your words, but your passion, your heart. They devoted themselves. They didn't just commit to this. They devoted themselves. And this is a really important point. These Christians were fully committed in their devotion to the Lord's church. And that's what we read in Acts chapter 2, 41 through 47. So what does this devotion look like? Well, it affected every aspect of their lives. They were devoted to Jesus and his church in every part of their lives. It wasn't just something they did on Sundays. It wasn't just some, you know, part of their life that they devoted to Jesus, like, like getting up and having a quiet time in the morning and praying and reading your Bible. It was everything. It was their whole life. Right. It was their thoughts. They were constantly taking their thoughts captive. It was their priorities. Everything, everything worked around the Lord and his church. It was their time. It was their energy, their money, their relationships, their work, their leisure. Every aspect of their life was devoted to Jesus Christ and his church. And the question is, are you devoted? I know you're committed, you're here this morning, but are you devoted to the Lord's church? And he, and he shares with us these four areas that, that they were devoted to. And the first one is they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. And, and the apostles' teaching is another word for the inspired word of God, the Bible. The apostles' teaching is the inspired words that the Holy Spirit led the apostles to teach these Christians. It was the word of God. That's what the apostles' teaching was. And these people were devoted to it. They were devoted, first of all, just to learning God's word. 
They couldn't get enough of it, in fact. When you, when you read some of these passages in uh, Acts chapter 2, it says in verse 46, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread and, and in their homes and so forth. In chapter 5, in verse 42, it says, Every day they were learning. God's word. And, you know, it makes me think about what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6, when he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They wanted more of God's word. They wanted to learn it. They wanted to hear everything about it. They, they lived on every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. In, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, Peter described it, describes it like this. He uses this illustration. He says, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. I like that illustration because you know that a newborn baby is insatiable. When it wants milk, it wants milk, period. It's not going to stop crying until it gets milk, right? Because it's just craving that milk. And the picture Peter uses here is that's how we should be for God's word, that we just crave every word of God. We want to hear what God has to say about every aspect of my life. I want his wisdom. I want his guidance. I want his strength. I want his forgiveness. I want everything that he offers, his grace. They wanted to learn. And they were devoted to it. Every day they would go down to the park. to Not the park. <laughs> the temple courts. That's kind of how I picture it. You know, this big grassy area and they're all sitting around and the apostles are teaching them. Every day. Not just Sunday, and, and not just for a couple hours. I picture them being there all day long, right? I know some of Paul's sermons were, were super long. They went in, you know, midnight and so forth until people were falling out of windows. They wanted this. They wanted it bad. And they were serious learners. They weren't there just you know, for the crowd or to, you know, hang out with everybody or, or even to, you know, because they were a little bit curious. It says in Acts 17 and verse 11, now the Berean Jews were more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. I mean, that's serious. That, that's not taking teaching lightly. First of all, they, they want to hear it, and then they want to sift through it, and they want to make sure that every word, you know, something that, that a lot of preachers say, I know I've said it many times, don't take my word for it. Google it. No, that's what Lester said. <laughs> Study it for yourself. You know, when, when I say something that, that maybe sound convicting to you or something and you're, you're uneasy with it, you should go home and study it. These new Christians who had committed their lives to Jesus were now devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. They were learning the word because learning the word is a very serious thing. It shouldn't be taken lightly. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's absolutely vital to our spiritual lives to learn the word of God. They were devoted not just to learning the word of God 
Somebody needs to mute themselves. <laughs> they were not only devoted to learning the word of God, they were devoted to practicing the word of God. And this is something else that I, I've said many times from the pulpit. You can learn the whole Bible. You can come here every Sunday and listen to thousands of sermons. But if you don't put that into practice, you're wasting your time. There, there's, it's just a waste of time. You have to put it into practice. And these early Christians immediately began applying these things that they learned from the apostles. They began worshiping together. They began serving one another. And, and you see that in the, the next few verses. They began helping the needy and, and giving their money toward helping others. And most importantly, they began preaching the gospel to all creation. And really, that's what the whole book of Acts is about. The book of Acts is a historical account of the Great Commission being lived out. That's what it is. And, and I, I'd just like to bring it to your attention. You know, Jesus said that we were, he told the apostles, go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Well, what did he just command them? Go and make disciples. And so that's what they did. They, they taught these new followers to go and make disciples. And then when those disciples made disciples, they taught their disciples to go and make disciples. And that's, that's why you're here today. Because people took that command seriously in their lives. And, and these early Christians, you, you, you see that. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, after Peter preached that sermon, 3,000 people were baptized. In Acts chapter 4, in verse 4 it says, But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. That's just the men. 3,000 the first day, within a week. 5,000 men. Who knows how many women in, in chapter 5 and verse 14, it says, Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to, the number, to their number. In chapter 6, verse 1, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, and then goes on to talk about the Hellenistic Jews. And then in chapter 6 and verse 7, it says, So the word of God spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. In chapter 8, verse 1 through 4, it says, On that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house, and dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. And then it goes on to say in, in verse 4 that everywhere they went, they preached the gospel. So the church is just scattered by persecution throughout the country. And everywhere they went, they began preaching the gospel. And disciples were made. In chapter 9 and verse 31, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in number. Why do I read all these passages to you? That's what we should be doing. Everywhere we go, we should be preaching the gospel to people. We should be reaching out to people. That's what devotion to the apostles' teaching results in. Obedience to those things that are important to God. Are you devoted to God's word? Do you, do you take it seriously? You know, Jesus told... Uh, the parable in Matthew 7, 24 through 27. He said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
The rain came down, streams rose, winds blew and beat against the house, yet, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. This should have even stronger meaning this morning, thinking about that hurricane. But isn't that what life is like? If, if, you're, not, if you're not founded on that solid word of God, when the storm hits in your life, you're not going to be able to handle it. But if you're firmly planted, you're firmly founded, on the word of God, when anything happens, you are able to trust in the Lord and to get through it. Are you devoted to God's word? The second area that these Christians devoted themselves was to the fellowship. They were devoted to sharing their lives with one another. They, in fact, loved being together. You can't help but see that. Every day, every day they met together. You know, fellowship is the bond of common purpose and devotion that binds us together in Christ. It's the bond of common purpose and devotion that binds us together in Christ. In other words, we, we are all striving for the same purpose. What's that purpose? To bring the lost to God and save the world. We're all working toward that together. And, and our, our efforts together is what binds us. The central element of fellowship is participation. It's involvement. It's involvement. When, when, I, when I think about our church, you know, um, sometimes I'll, I'll men mention that we could use some more volunteers for something. And it seems like it never fails. The same people, not, they don't come up and say, I'll do it. They just, they just jump in and do it. They just start doing it. And they take care of these things. And, and that's what fellowship is. It's, it's that, that working together for the success of the whole. Yes. It's all doing our part in serving the church so that the church might be truly glorious and successful in God's world. And each person is contributing to that in their different ways. You know, through, through my time here in Encinitas, we've had people in construction that helped build this church. We've had people in finance that helped finance this church. We've had, you know, we have people with different gifts that contribute their gift to the success of the church. And that's what God's plan is. That's why he gave us these gifts. 1 Peter 4.10 Use whatever you have received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Everybody working together, everybody involved, everybody participating, everybody, and not, not just once in a while, they were devoted. Remember what that word means? Diligent, ardent. They were, they were totally into it. They were devoted to caring for one another. This is a part of fellowship too. One of the first things <clears throat> you see is how they immediately began selling their possessions. It didn't matter what it was going to cost them in order to care for their brothers and sisters. They were going to make it happen one way or another. And so many of them sold their possessions. 
Some of them sold their lands and their houses so that they could lay the money at the apostles' feet and it could be distributed to everyone who had a need. And in, in chapter 5 it says, you know, there were no needy among them anymore. Because from time to time, someone would go out and sell something and lay it at the apostles' feet and, and all their needs were met. That's what fellowship is. It's, it's that common purpose and devotion to the Lord and his, and his plan for us. They took care of widows and orphans. You know, in, in Acts chapter 6, there, there rose this problem in the church. By now there's thousands, thousands of Christians in Jerusalem. And one of the things that was happening was the, the Hellenistic Jews were being overlooked by the distrib distribution of food. They, they would provide meals for the widows. And, and so they went to the apostles and the, they told the apostles and the apostles said, listen, choose six from among you who are filled with the Holy Spirit and wisdom and we'll turn this task over to them so that we can give ourselves to, to prayer and ministry of the word. Not that they weren't willing to roll up their sleeves and go serve those widows themselves. But they wanted everybody to participate. Everybody to be involved in this. And so they immediately chose these men, what we call deacons today, servants. That's what the word means. Servants who were filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, they were willing and ready and they were spiritual people. I, I, I like that qualification filled with the Holy Spirit because you don't want to pick the wrong person to, you know, take care of other people. Because you know what happens? They, they might say something they shouldn't say or express some, you know, disgust or something that they don't like about that person. And, and cause terrible damage in the church. So these were people who were devoted. These were people who were, who were giving them all to that. And you know, we're commanded in James 1, in verse 27, to do the same, to take care of widows and orphans in their distress. And I think about how that we, we have this Orphan Sunday, and it's just around the corner, folks. Once a year, and we, we have been so generous in doing that. And, and you can go look at some of the works that we've been involved in on the wall over here. But that's God's plan. That's what he wants us to do, to, to be involved in taking care of our brothers and sisters and, and those in need. And so, again, I, are you devoted to the fellowship of the church? Are you, are you devoted to sharing in the, the common purpose of the church here in Encinitas? Are, are you devoted to, to caring for one another? And, and I know that so many of you are, that, that you look out for each other and care for each other. The third area that they were devoted to is breaking of bread. And this, this phrase, breaking of bread, really has two meanings in the New Testament. And the, the first one, it has to do with the Lord's Supper. That Jesus, when he was having the Passover feast, when he was having a meal with the, the disciples, the night before he was betrayed, he took some bread and he broke it and he gave thanks and he passed around and he said, this is my body which is given for you. And he was... He was letting them know that I'm about to go to the cross and I'm about to die this horrible death and it's all for you. And then he took the cup, the wine, and he gave thanks and he, he said, and this is my blood of the new covenant, just as Jim explained it during the Lord's Supper this morning. That, that this is the blood of the new covenant, the new covenant of grace. God's unmerited favor. 
that would, would be poured out on us at the death of Jesus. And so these Christians were devoted to partaking of the Lord's Supper because Jesus had instituted it and he had told them to do it in remembrance of me. This was something that, that they did regularly, every week, in fact, every Sunday. We know that they took time out when they gathered together to partake of the Lord's Supper and to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And in fact, in, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, Paul was visiting another church. It says, on the first day of the week, they came together to break bread. And, and just to indicate that this had become the tradition. This had become what the, what the Lord's church does. They meet together for the Lord's Supper. And these early Christians were devoted to that. They wouldn't miss it. I've known, I've known of Christians who have come and sat down and waited until the Lord's Supper was over and then left and gone to Disneyland or something. But that tells you something. That tells you something, doesn't it? That they're devoted to that. They know that this is the Lord's will and they have given themselves to do that. This was a sober part of their worship. And, and it's, it should be today too. You know, Paul wrote to the church in Corinth in chapter 11 and he, he really admonished them for taking the Lord's Supper lightly. They would come together for a meal and there would be some in the church who had nothing to bring to eat. And the ones who had food would eat all their food and would not share. And then they would take a moment to have the Lord's Supper. And Paul was saying, how can you do that? You, you've just really disgraced it. Because the Lord's Supper is what gets us to that place where we remember our service to Jesus and his church and to the world. In fact, Paul would go on to say, let each one examine himself. Let him take a moment and see if his heart and mind is in the right place before he partakes of the Lord's Supper. These people were serious about this. They were devoted to it. The other way that breaking of bread is used in the New Testament is just common meals. And, you know, when you think about it, after being taught God's word and fellowship at the temple courts, worshiping the Lord, they would go to each other's homes and eat a meal together. You read that in Acts chapter 2, and verse 46. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. This was a common practice. After worship, they go home with one another and have meals together. And, and you know, this, this was something that you saw Jesus doing all the time. When you read through the Gospels, you'll find him at the table a lot. I mean, he, he was eating at people's houses all the time, wasn't he? And you know why? Because it's really at those intimate moments that we really learn about one another. We really get to know one another. Like the time that he ate at Mary and Martha's house, remember that? And Martha was in the kitchen, and man, she was working up a storm, and and Mary, she was out there sitting at the feet of Jesus. And she finally got so upset, she came in and she told Jesus, we, you're going to let her just sit there? Or you're going to tell her to come help me? Martha, Martha. <laughs> there are a lot of things that are important. <laughs> Mary's chosen the one that's most important. When we sit down and eat together, and this is something I so miss about our potlucks. We 
get to know each other. We, I mean, I, I always try to sit with a different person. And, and if you've ever sat with me during a potluck, you know I ask a million questions. Where'd you grow up? <laughs> you know? Where'd you go to school? Have you always been a member of the Church of Christ? I'll, I'll ask you all kinds of off-the-wall questions. Just All I want to do is I want to get to know you. I want, I want to really know you. Not, not just shake your hand Sunday morning and say hi and how, how's your week been? And I mean, really get to know you. How, how are your kids? I want to know how many kids you have. Where, you know, where, where are they at? Are they at school or, you know, are they at college? Or, well, I want to know everything about you. Genuinely. I want to be your friend. I want, I want to minister to you. And I want you to minister to me. And so this whole idea of having meals together is so important in church, in a church, in, in being devoted to fellowship and breaking of bread. Are you devoted to the breaking of bread together more than just the Lord's Supper on Sunday mornings? I mean, I, I look around and I've had dinner at many of your houses. And it was always good. I don't want to say who's the best cook. <laughs> But some of your cooking I've experienced more than just once. <laughs> oh, really? I, I've, I've had dinner at your homes, and I feel like I'm closer to you because of that. And that's the whole plan of God, is that we be a family, that we be a, a community that really cares about each other. And, and the Lord's Supper reminds us of that. It reminds us that, that Jesus loved us and was family to us and that we should be that to one another. And the last one that we see in this, this scripture, Acts 2.42, is that they were devoted to prayer and literally praying together. Prayer was this vital part of the early church. And, and you, can, you can read in Acts chapter 4. You can read there. I don't have it with me. But Acts chapter 4. Well, actually, I do. Let me read it to you. Acts chapter 4, verse 23. Amen. And you know, it's not 23. It's Acts chapter 4. Hang on, just. Sorry about that. It is 23. Acts 4, 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Now this was right after Peter and John were released from prison for preaching the gospel around Jerusalem. And they had been warned, don't you do this anymore or, or there's going to be a price to be paid. And so the first thing they did when they got out of jail is went to the church who actually had been meeting together praying. Sovereign Lord, they said, you, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by your Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. We studied that psalm, by the way. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel 
in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Interesting they didn't pray, God, keep us safe. God, don't let us have to go back to prison again. Now they said, just give us the boldness to get right back out there and do what you commanded us to do. They prayed about everything. They prayed about their families. They, they prayed prayers of thanksgiving. They, they prayed for everything. And that was because they were taught to be devoted to prayer. To pray about everything, Ephesians 6, verse 18, and, and to be devoted to it in Colossians 4 and verse 2. And they were devoted especially to praying for the church. And you, you see this in Paul's writings a lot. The church was actually birthed in prayer. You remember Jesus in John chapter 17, what we call the high priestly prayer? Jesus prayed for the church, that they would be one and that they would, they would be successful. And then in chapter 1 of Acts, verse 14, we see the disciples and the, the, the leaders of the church gathered together praying, waiting for the Holy Spirit to come upon them to begin the church. And then in chapter 6, we see him praying about choosing the right leaders to serve the widows in their congregation. And, and on and on it goes. They're praying about everything for the church. And it should be our constant prayer as well. Are you praying for our church? Because look, it's not, it's not well right now. We're still reeling from this pandemic. And we should be devoted to praying for our church that we can get our members to come back and to worship the Lord together and to participate and be devoted to the fellowship and to, to be all those things that we once were. Are you devoted to prayer? You know, this passage ends with these words. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And, and I read you those scriptures through Acts, chronicling the growth of the church in just those first few months. And let me tell you something. If we were as devoted to the Lord's church as they were, we would be adding to the Lord's church every day too. And this is really a call to check ourselves. Yeah, we, we made a commitment to Jesus, but are we devoted to doing his will? Because he's called us to do these things. This, this isn't just something I made up. I, I encourage you, go back and read the book of Acts. And look at how those Christians live, because that's how we should be living today. So I, I just want to encourage you this morning. Be devoted 
Not just be committed, be devoted. Be zealous. You know, Paul wrote in Romans 12, verse 11, to never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Fan that flame. Get it going again. Get that fire burning within again where, where you really want to do the Lord's will. Okay. Begin sharing the gospel with people. Begin serving and giving like the early church did. We're going to sing this song in closing.